Welcome to the Rule of Law Education Centre Simple Explainer Series. I have Professor Martin Krieger of the University of New South Wales and my colleague from the Rule of Law Institute, Chris Merritt, speaking to us today. He's speaking to discuss a problem in Eastern Europe, not what is happening in Ukraine, but what is happening in Hungary and Poland and their showdown with EU regarding rule of law breaches. Professor Martin Krieger is the Gordon Samuels Professor of Law and Social Theory and Co-Director of the Network for Interdisciplinary Studies of Law at the University of New South Wales. His field of expertise is the rule of law in former communist countries, especially Eastern European countries, and has become a one of Australia's foremost thinkers on the rule of law. He has a long association and friendship with the Rule of Law Institute and is with great pleasure we speak to him today. Interestingly, for our topic on Eastern Europe, Professor Krieger's parents were born in Warsaw, the capital of Poland, in 1917, and they experienced the impact of communism firsthand. So with great pleasure, we welcome Professor Krieger today. Today we'll be talking about Poland and Hungary and particularly the way their democratic processes have declined in the last 10 years. Professor Krieger, can you explain to us what has happened in these countries? <laughs> That's not a small question. Uh, well, it's part of a larger trend that's in many countries, in many parts of the world, in Latin America, in, uh, in the Philippines, which is called populism. And what's meant by that is that leaders come up and they say they re represent, and Donald Trump is another, they represent the real people. And uh, that means the, pe the working people, the real people, not the elites. And they, in the name of these elites, turn out to win elections. And then they go after the institutions, the central institutions, which might temper their power or restrain them. And they do it in a very systematic way and very often in a very similar way. So some of the things that have been done in Hungary and Poland are what was done before them in Turkey, done in other countries like Venezuela. And what happened in Hungary and Poland specifically is that in Hungary, it started earlier, in Hungary, the present Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, was elected to power with a, not a particularly uh, radical public policy. He was elected with 53% of the vote, but he got 60, because of the electoral system, he got 68% of the seats, which is a, we don't care about the numbers, but the numbers this time are particularly important because 68 is more than 66, that is more than two thirds. That gave him, his party, Fides as it's called, uh, the power, it was what we call a, a qualified majority, it gave him the power to change the constitution. And he, so for the next several years, he went after, he, first of all, he amended the constitution a million times. Then in 2011, he put in a new constitution without any consultation. Then he went after the constitutional court to make it his own. What they normally do, and this was done later in Poland, so first of all, they weaken the court, then they take over the court, and then they strengthen the court to do their bidding. So people don't go to the constitutional court, which is, the, in Australia, we don't have a separate constitutional court, but we've got the constitutional jurisdiction of the high court. In many countries in Europe, you have a separate court which deals with constitutional matters, and uh, that's true after the fall of communism in all the post-communist countries. So he went after the constitutional court. First he weakened it, then he packed it, and then he restricted its jurisdiction. Sometimes he gave it more jurisdiction because now it was his court. So citizens don't go to the court uh, as they used to in large numbers in, in Hungary and in Poland because you can't win against the government in the court. That's particularly blatant in, in Poland. So in Hungary, back to Hungary, went after the Constitutional Court. Then he went after, that is, tried to get institutional control over the ordinary courts. Uh, he then also went after a number of independent institutions, Central Bank, Ombudsman's Office, Prosecutor, and so on. Media. He's got almost all the media. In Poland, it started five years later in 2015, but it was a simple, similar playbook, and people talk about the kind of populist playbook. So in Poland, 
they immediately went after the Constitutional Court, flattened it, and then got their own guys in it. And now, whenever, as has happened in the last cases you're talking about, they want to object to anything European, the government sends, or the prosecutor in particular, sends a request to the, uh, to the Constitutional Court, which decides in the government's favour. In Poland, uh, the public media became national media, that is, it's completely controlled by the government. But in Poland, because it has a tradition of some civil independence, there are still uh, significant private media not owned by the government. But they also, for example, the Minister of Justice was fused with the prosecutor's office. So it's the same guy, very radical guy. And he has extraordinary supervision powers over the courts. Then they went after the Supreme Court, which in this separate system doesn't deal with constitutional matters. So constitutional courts, the constitutional Supreme Courts, as here at the High Court in ordinary jurisdiction of appeal. They went after the leader, the president of the Supreme Court. They went after the court system as a whole. So that now, whereas in uh, these post-communist countries, there was a history under communism that uh, the judges were completely instruments of the ruling power. So after communism collapsed, the selection of judges was put in the hands of judges. And uh, that's been abolished. So now the people who are in the sort of National Council of the Judiciary, as it's called in Poland, are government or parliamentary appointees. But since the government has the majority, they're government appointees. They, what else did they do? They sue often. A friend of mine, actually professor of jurisprudence at Sydney University, has had four suits against him, two from the government, two from the government media. He's won so far all of them, which is one of the interesting things. In the ordinary courts, there are still some brave judges, and it's, there are 10,000 judges, so it's a lot to deal with, and they haven't all been steamrolled. But that's the trend, and that's the ambition, and it happens, well, it already had happened in Turkey. Uh, it's happened to a great extent in Hungary and Poland. They also fiddle with the electoral system. They haven't made themselves bulletproof, and soon we'll see what happens in Hungary, where there are elections late at, well, in a month or two, uh, they're not bulletproof because this vast array of opposition parties who have very different views from the far right to the left have decided that the only way they can win, beat Orban is to unite for the elections, which they've managed to do. How long that'll last, I don't know. But that's a new development. Uh, in Poland, the elections are later and the opposition is still squabbling. So it hasn't happened. So roughly, it's a power grab by the government. But it's a different power grab from what we're used to in that, come, in that part of the world historically, and what the Russians are doing now. It's not a violent power grab. And it's not, and this is important for law and rule of law, it's not a confessedly anti-legal power grab. These people don't believe in liberties, but they are using law. That's very, very important. They say in Hungary, because they've got the constitutional majority, they can do things legally. So whatever they do, which is that just the same and just as vicious as what the Poles do, the Poles have to cheat because they don't have that majority. The Hungarians don't have to cheat because they can do what they like legally. And a lot of what they do with the law is very, very formal. So if they... Uh, for example, they could say about the National Council of the Judiciary, well, in Australia, the judges don't appoint the judges to the High Court. That's true. And then they'll say in Luxembourg, something else we do is done. But what makes a difference, a different part, is not the formalities, which they'll try to stick to, but the spirit, if you like, with which they do it, and the reason they choose to do A, B, C, and D. One of the things I wanted to get your, your take on was the implications of this, this recent decision by the European Court of Justice. As I understand it, the Poles tried to challenge, tried to knock down a regulation that would have imposed or does impose a fine um, for failure to adhere to the rule of law. I think the court imposed something like a million dollars a day. <clears throat> now they've failed. Um, the court 
um, has made it very clear that that regulation stands. But the, the latest development um, seems to be a little bit of movement by the polls. They've, they've offered to abolish um, the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court, which the, uh, the European authorities have said, yes, fine, as far as it goes, but uh, what about all those judges who have been suspended? And what are you going to do with all those politically appointed judges? Are they going to remain on the Supreme Court? What's your take on that? Are we seeing a, a change in tempo by, or, or attitude by the polls? Or is this simply um, trying to patch over um, something that can't be patched over? Uh, the latter. <laughs> and very, very dramatically so. I mean... Uh, the, so the guy who runs Poland has no public official position. He's not prime minister. He's not president. He's leader of the party, but that's not a public position. Uh, his name is Kaczynski. Then he runs the prime minister and a separate office, much less power, but much more, more international exposure is the president. And the president was clearly being leaned on internationally and was worried. I mean, Poland has become, in many respects, an international pariah, certainly within Europe. And he was he suggested that he would put up himself laws which abolished, and I hadn't mentioned, I'm glad you did mention, they, the Poles in part of this range of activities to um, control the courts, set up what they call a disciplinary chamber whose members get paid 40% more than ordinary judges and whose job primarily is to discipline judges, not, that's not an appeal saying we have a difference on a point of law. This is a discipline for people who step out of line. One way of stepping out of line is to apply, which is absolutely kosher under European law, to the European Court of Justice or the European Court of Human Rights where you believe that European law has been violated by the government. So the disciplinary chamber hears cases brought by this zealous uh, prosecutor against judges who are exerting their legal rights to question what the government is doing. So he said, well, I think this has been noised a couple of times that because this costs money, uh, we will, initially they said they would abolish, he said he would abolish the disciplinary chamber. Now Kaczynski, the man I mentioned, has suggested he's not satisfied, first of all he was angry, but then he, he's now softened it and said, well, we want to do it a little differently, we don't want to abolish the chamber, but we'll make it that they can still discipline prosecutors and lawyers, but not judges. But anyway, this is all talk at the moment. And it's a hope, and then they talked about it with, um, with the head of the European uh, Union, European Commission, and she was not satisfied. They're trying, this is an attempt just to uh, hold on to what they can, because they've got a lot of other levers as well uh, that aren't being talked about, uh, and try to say, look, we're clear, we're, we heard you. But it's... At the same time, there, a number of cases have gone to the Polish Constitutional Court, which have said of European court judgments that these violate the Polish Constitution and therefore the Poles uh, shouldn't, uh, are, are not bound by them. That's unprecedented in, in European law. Mm. So no, a short answer, I don't seem to be capable of making a short answer. Short answer is this is uh, just make work. The, um... The other thing that uh, jumped out at me from that um, that judgment by the European Court was sorry, um, which judge? You're not talking about the recent judgment last week. Yes, well, yes. that's a different story. That's mm. sorry, that's a completely different story. The first story is about the disciplinary tribunals. Yeah, this, this story, uh, which we don't have the judgment yet, we've got the press release, but that was when they were negotiating uh, funding particularly COVID relief, huge amounts of money, because Poland gets more money than any other country in the EU, and Hungary's got a lot of money. There were concerns about the general 
situation of the rule of law in both these countries, but then particular concerns that in Hungary, where I'm going next week, uh, a lot of this money was being siphoned off for corrupt and kleptocratic purposes. Mm. So a resolution was passed by the European Parliament saying that uh, the, I never remember which is the commission, which is the parliament, that the Europeans could impose conditions and withhold funds. So they say it's not a fine. They say we're holding funds. So we can, they're saying we can, they haven't done it yet. They're saying we can withhold funds if it is shown that the situation of the rule of law threatens the proper allocation of those funds. It's important to see those restrictions. So they're saying we're not um, authorising the withholding of funds because of the situation of the rule of law in these countries. We're saying funds are going to be withheld if the situation has potential effects on the use of those funds. Mm -hmm. Now, that was the regulation. The Poles and the Hungarians uh, sued to say that it was illegal and the uh, under European law. And the court resoundingly, but limitedly, said it's legal for this purpose. Now, what that means in law, as you know, is how far and how narrowly that's going to be interpreted. But at the moment, it's not saying that the uh, outside the provisions, what's called the nuclear option of Section 7 of the EU Treaty, which in the last instance could take rights and privileges away from the country in the EU, but which can never work because it's got to be unanimous and Hungary will never vote against Poland on this and Poland won't vote against Hungary. Uh, they're saying in this circumstance, that is the allocation of funds, we can, or not, not we, uh, the European Commission can take account of the rule of law situation if it threatens the allocation of funds. The, the other thought that, uh, that jumped out at me, I, th I think the judgment has been um, made public now, the, but the, the other thought that jumped out at me is that the, that judgment has an educational uh, impact as well. Uh, there's a lot of people in, in this country, for example, who might be a little bit surprised at how, how strong the Europeans are when it goes to insisting on things like uh, a proper appeal mechanism when there's a, a decision that goes against an individual. Um, there are some people in New South Wales, for example, who might raise their eyebrows at that when they consider that in the light of the, the very restricted appeals uh, available from a decision of ICAC. Mm -hmm. Look, the strength of the EU is still being tested because the, the Hungarians have been getting, and the Poles have got away with everything so far. There's been a lot of noise. There have been a lot of lost cases, some lost cases, uh, particularly after Poland joined. They were shy to go after Hungary in the first years, didn't know what to do. And they still don't clearly know what to do because there are so many different interests within Europe. Uh, but they're trying to get tougher. And one of the reasons that I talked about the kind of legalism of these regimes is that they keep trying to come back to the EU and say, look, we've done nothing uh, that breaks the law here, even though it's blindingly obvious that what they're doing is using the law, what they call rule by law, not rule of, of law, yeah. not to be restricted, but to be uh, to put to their service. So, the strength of the EU is still being tested. Even this latest decision, what that means is that the regulation is legal. It's still, a case has still to be bought, brought. And when a case is brought, then it's going to be fought. And who knows how those judgments will go. We just don't know that yet. Mm. So this is probably not going to be the last that uh, we've heard about this affair. Absolutely not. No, no, this is the beginning. It's the beginning of this affair, absolutely. And... There are a number of other cases where the European court has held that Polish practices violate European law. The Polish court has said they don't. And whether or not the Polish court says they have or they haven't, the government is ignoring them so far. Mm. So, so, the, the dismissed judges, for example, are still dismissed, most of them. 
But what's going to happen to those people? Would they need to be uh, reinstated before uh, the European authorities would um, say, OK, Poland, uh, we're no we no longer have concerns about the rule of law in that country? Well, there's a lot of things that would have to happen. First of all, they're not, they're not sacked yet. They're uh, relieved of their duties. One guy hasn't uh, heard a case for several years. So his demand, and several judges are in that position, is to be allowed to come back to judging. So that's one story. The, the guys that the government has uh, signalled out would have to be allowed to judge again. A second story are these disciplinary tribunals. You've got all these hacks there who are making a lot more money than their peers, and their job was to uh, hear, hear disciplinary matter. What do you do with them? If you're abolishing the disciplinary tribunal, do they lose their jobs uh, or do they get reassigned? This all has to be worked through. I think the, the, the government's suggesting both. They're, they're suggesting that some of them could retire, uh, some could... Uh, be transferred across to the Supreme Court, yeah. which seems to perpetuate the problem, wouldn't it? Well, I think it would. And, and uh, it's, you know, it's not, if you've got liberal sentiments or rule of law sentiments, when a government has deliberately put its placement into so many positions, say it's not easy what you do in, a, in an honourable way, these guys may not have been all of them crooks, though mm. they knew what they were getting into. Do you sack them? Do you reassign them as there's been talk? And what does it mean to reassign them? They did come in to a plain situation where they were being appointed for political purposes. So do you say, all right, well, you don't have that job, but you may as well go to the uh, bankruptcy court. Mm. Because a lot of people still, in Polish, the word is people have hooks on other people. And do, do other hooks removed? We don't know. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, you'd be best placed to, to provide a, a personal view on this, but is it a cultural problem? Is, is the rule of law a foreign concept in Poland? It's not, it, it's a complicated story because it, to come back to your first question, it is in many ways a cultural issue ultimately rather than a question of institutional design. And I think that's one of the big mistakes that the world made after 1989 to think that if you've had bad institutions, the solution is simply to put in good institutions. So you have these models and the models go around the world. Uh, my view is that in the, particular, in the early 90s, we were so confident that the Soviet game was up. There was only one game left in town, it was ours, that we didn't really have to argue it, we just had to install it. And in countries with different traditions, you can see that with Putin now, uh, it takes, nothing's gonna bring him around, but people have to discover and learn and benefit from a change in the rules. They don't suddenly become different people. And we spent a lot more time installing than we did explaining uh, what the virtues of these different systems are. And it's not clear to me that even if we did a lot more explaining, we could have prevailed, but also it's, I mean, Poland is a semi-Western country. By semi, I mean, there are a lot of people, big cities, highly educated, uh, cosmopolitan in the sense they know what goes on in other countries. And there are a lot of people who aren't like that in, East, in the Eastern areas, etc. They don't have an experience of, of uh, independent judges, of straight ways of doing things, of where the rules count. And that takes time. It's not impossible. We've seen it. It's not impossible in some countries where things have have changed around, but it's hard. And uh, yeah, it's hard. The, uh, do you think the one of the lessons from what's happening in in Poland and and in Hungary is 
Do you think we're a little bit too complacent about the the core elements of the rule of law in this country? I mean, it's it's um, it's becoming more common um, for states to legislate retrospectively to change legal rights um, or take away legal rights uh, with retrospective effect. Uh, do you think we need to take the rule of law, our, our leaders, our political leaders, need to take the rule of law far more seriously than they do? Well, I think it's good to take it as seriously as you can because the goal of the rule of law, the ideal, that is that power should be tempered, constrained, moderated, is something which is so hugely important, but people who have power don't find it appealing very often. And uh, we still have, as one would have said 10 years ago, the Americans have all the more, very strong institutional supports, traditions and so on. But what we're starting to see now is that these things can erode. Mm. And if you're not watching, uh, then you might be taken completely by surprise. Still, you know, I mean, one of the, I wrote a piece uh, maybe I sent it to you because it, it talks about quite a few of these things. My question was, why was it so easy for Orban and Kaczynski to do what Trump found it so hard to do, just dismiss the institutions? Because they, they all had the same attitude. They thought the institutions were theirs, not public institutions which should frame what they do. And my story is partly that, uh, the one that I've just said, that we didn't take into account that there are a lot of values in a lot of countries where the rule of law is not prominent. And, uh, and the populists knew that. We didn't. Sorry, I'm, when I say we, I mean, a lot of liberal reformers just thought, look, this is so obvious, restraining power, particularly in countries where power had been so abused as it had been in communist countries. So we give them the better way. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for it too, for a while. And then it was rocked because the West started to look a bit more gappy than it did after the financial crisis and various other things. Uh, and the populace said, yes, we can go back to our nastier traditions, I would call them, and pump them up. Mm -hmm. uh, our sovereignty is being impaired. Uh, these new social movements are immoral. The West is full of of people who've lost the side of religion and various other things and push and push and push that. So it's not just nasty people, it's people who think that their values are being threatened by these new reforms. Now in Australia, in a way, we have a right to be complacent because quite apart from the law, there are all these sorts of attitudes that we talked about in the, the David Neal's book, which go back a long way. But we know, we've seen it in America, and we can see it in the sorts of things that you may, you may be talking about, that these things can be eroded if you don't keep emphasising. For me, the emphasis should be on the value, and that's the book I'm writing now called Tempering Power, rather than the particular institutions. For me, they don't matter too much because you can replace them so long as people are hemmed in by rules of the game. Uh, whereas in, in Hungary and Poland, they look at the rules of the game and they say, how can we game them? And that's mm -hmm. what they do. They don't, they don't smash them the way that Putin would or that Lenin did, but they try to game them. Mm. The, it, it highlights the fact that the judiciary uh, in those countries is absolutely central to ensuring the strength of the rule of law, not simply rule by law or rule of law, but the, the rule of law, the concept, the collection of principles. Do you think the judiciary in this country uh, universally is uh, alert to this? Do you think this is one of their core uh, motivating features? Look, my sense is that the judiciary in this country uh, thinks like lawyers, and that's a big deal because you can, you can get a degree and not think like a lawyer, but think like an appointee or think like somebody who's got to wait for the telephone call, tell you what you do. Um, if you go back to the Lionel Murphy affair, 
I don't want to go into the ins or outs of it. I have no competence there. But that a guy should be sued, a high court judge should be in such trouble because he said, what about my little mate, is a good thing. Uh, and a rare thing in some countries. I mean, who would think that's a big deal? Uh, and I think that, of course, there's corruption everywhere. In, sorry, in every country. Not everywhere in every country, but in every country. Uh, and people with power who sort of stack bodies like administrative appeals bodies with their mates uh, aren't thinking in these terms. Mm. So it's it's a complex... I mean, if you want to weigh the balance, it's never going to be 100% or 0%. Um, but I think compared to most of the countries I know, and of course I know some pretty nasty countries because I used to do some work in Myanmar, well, compared to Myanmar, it's easy, uh, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, compared to a lot of other countries, it's also easy. I mean, I still think that we're, we're a law-framed country to an extent that few that I know are. That doesn't mean it's going to last. Mm. Are there any other uh, incidents that have arisen in Poland and Hungary that you think might arise and become a threat to the rule of law in this country? Well, see, I, I've got a, a somewhat broader conception of the rule of law, so I don't focus this only or even primarily on the central legal institutions. Because for me, the rule of law exists to the extent that a guy who puts in a tender for a job, doesn't know from the start that he's going to get it. Hmm. Uh, or election, I've got a webinar tomorrow on with a great uh, specialist on democracy um, from Princeton. His book is Democracy Rules, Liberty, Equality, Uncertainty. Hmm. The uncertainty is important. Uh, in a the rule of law exists when you've got rules, which mean that you know the rules, but a lot of outcomes are uncertain. If you can um, fix the outcomes, in Hungary, uh, the, the, this is what has led a one author to do a series of books about what he calls the mafia state. Tenders for huge billion or million dollar oh, foreign. <laughs> Uh, activities are fixed again and again. So the mates of Orban have made a mozza out of this regime. It's less clearly that way, though it's highly nepotistic, in Poland. Um, well, we read tenders too. Some people here read tenders. You've, you've got to think that's a worry. Or packing various, various uh, semi-public bodies or allegedly public bodies with your mates is a worry. But the sort of, it used to be said of Poles that they live around the law under communism. That's a big deal. I mean, if people, if the law doesn't really count in the decisions people make, it's not a purely institutional matter because most of them will never get to a court. Or if, if you want to know if the, about health in a society, you've got to look at more than hospitals. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know about the rule of law in a society, you've got to look at more than courts. Much more, much more. Yeah. And, uh, and when you're looking at courts, it's easy to be deceived, and that's what the modern rulers are showing, by formal adherence to law. So, again and again, when we talk about the rule of law, we point at some formal irregularity, for example, retrospectivity or broadness, etc. But that's not the problem in these places. They, they have lawyers advise them every way. I'm going to be part of next week an outfit which has been kicked out of Hungary to Austria. It's called the Central European University. It's an amazing place. Great university. Uh, it was kicked out on the basis of uh, a law which was brought in in 2017, just because it was a Western uh, influence. And uh, I remember being at a conference in 2017 where the 
rector of the university, explained, he said, look, it's bewildering. We, everyone here knows that we're being kicked out for political reasons, but when we send our people to talk to the government's people, all they talk is section three, subsection two, uh, A of the this act or that act. They pretend that it's yeah. all got to do with the law, but everyone knows that that's not the game. Yeah. That's a pretty common misconception about the rules of law, actually, that uh, simply applying uh, statutes um, ticks that box. That uh, you, you see it all over the place, particularly in this country. Yeah, you do see it all over the place, and most people and lawyers, uh, big sinners in this too, think that the rule of law is about laws. Mm-hmm. And the rule of law is about a lot more than laws. It's about thinking that law matters, about um, knowing what the law is when it about. It's in the service of a much bigger ideal, which is uh, framing and taming the exercise of power. And if you don't have that, then all the sort of legal punctiliousness is not worth the hill of beans. Well, that's absolutely excellent. And I love the way you're saying framing about the exercise of power, because that is what we are spending so much of our education resources explaining why these concepts, separation of power, independent judiciary, fair and prompt trial, is actually about making sure one person or one group of people doesn't hold the power. Like that big picture is, it's just about when you give one person all the power, it's quite dangerous and you need checks and balances to manage that and as you rightly say and that's such a good example that hungary it can be lawful so um, we can't change our constitution as easily as they can but we can put in lawful laws public health orders which are all lawful which might not be good laws and that's our big problem like you say it's the big picture not just is our independent judiciary independent you know are we keeping our checks and balances so that's absolutely fantastic. And, and to link what you've just said, Sally, with uh, a question Chris asked, key to it, key to holding on to it, onto that sort of value, those values, uh, is social mobilisation. It's independence of groups. It's people, because if you don't have a population which is alert to invasions of space, their space, or uh, arbitrary exercises of power. If the population is suborned or apathetic or just not interested, then all the legal jiggery pokery isn't worth anything. And and, uh, that's why just as important as judges are free associations or the media or political parties. Uh, They're all part of a mix and lawyers focus on the legal part of the mix, and often forget that what we're after is a a goal in which, from which we all benefit, to which law plays its, in which law plays its part, but it's one of several things it plays its part, not always the most important. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. And we thank you so much for coming to meet with us, Professor Krieger.